Welcome to this video on rifampin. Before we start, let's talk about objectives for the video. By the end of the video, you should know the uses of rifampin. You should know its mechanism of action. You should know what the deal is with rifampin and resistance. And you should know what the deal is with rifampin and drug-drug interactions. When we think about rifampin, most of us think, oh yeah, it's that drug that treats TB. But it's actually a lot more versatile than you might think. It's used for other mycobacterial infections, like leprosy. But more commonly, it's actually used to treat staph infections, especially device-related infections like prosthetic valves infected with staph aureus or staph epidermidis. Why does it work against them? Well, we'll get to that. But during this video, just keep in mind that rifampin is not just a TB drug. So let's talk about how it works. Here's a bacterial cell, and we know that most antibiotics work by messing with some of the processes here. So they can either mess with DNA synthesis, mRNA synthesis, protein translation, folate metabolism, or potentially the cell wall. So which of these things does rifampin target? Well, it happens to inhibit RNA polymerase. So in the presence of rifampin, this bacterial cell can't make mRNA and thus can't make proteins. Now rifampin has a special property, which is that it can kill semi-dormant TB. What is semi-dormant TB? As you might guess, it's TB that's less metabolically active and dividing less rapidly. The fact that rifampin can kill these guys is important because isoniazide and ethambutol cannot. Why? Well, the reason is isoniazide and ethambutol both stop mycobacteria from being able to make new cell wall. Semidorbin TB is not making much cell wall, so it can survive treatment with those drugs. The reason we're making a point of this is that it explains why rifampin allows short course treatment. So with rifampin, you can treat for six to nine months and eradicate the TB. Whereas without rifampin, you would need 18 to 24 months. Because without rifampin, you would need to wait for all these semi-dormant TB to become active and then be killed by isoniazide or ethambutol, or to be killed by the immune system. There are a couple of other aspects of rifampin that make it a great drug. One is that it's okay in pregnancy. And another is that it distributes very widely. In particular, it can get into the CSF, which is helpful, of course, for treating any CNS infection. And then there's also the fact that it penetrates very well into biofilms. And that is precisely why it's good for treating staph infections of prosthetic valves or prosthetic joints. So these are kind of like the selling points of rifampin, you could say. And now let's talk about some of the things that are maybe not such selling points. So for one thing, you can get red or orange body fluids from rifampin. So let's look at this guy as an example. So what you can get is red-orange urine, and that's because rifampin is renally excreted, as well as red-orange tears and red-orange sweat, and that's because rifampin distributes well outside of the vasculature. But actually, this is not such a bad thing, because apart from maybe staining your contact lenses, it's pretty harmless. And actually, it's a pretty useful marker for compliance. So this guy here we know is A-OK. -okay. He's been taking his rifampin. So let's not really consider this a bad thing, and let's put it over there in the pros. So what are some actual problems with rifampin? Well, one of them is going to be hepatotoxicity. So actually about 15% of people taking rifampin are going to have a rise in their LFTs. And in most cases, that's going to be fine, actually. But the guidelines say that if the LFTs rise to three times their normal level and you have symptoms, then you should stop rifampin. Or if the LFTs rise to five times their normal level and you don't have symptoms. And we've noticed that people who drink alcohol actually have an increased risk of hepatotoxicity. So people taking rifampin should actually cut down on their alcohol use. Another problem with rifampin is that when you use it alone, 
you get very rapid resistance. And one example of that is that if you take a petri dish of Staph aureus and incubate it with low dose rifampin overnight, in the morning you'll be able to culture out resistant organisms. So if you're using rifampin to treat a device-related infection, you're going to use it in combination with other drugs. And it's the same thing for TB. If you're treating TB, you're going to use rifampin in combination with other drugs. And that's why we're all familiar with this acronym RIPE. So promise that you will always give rifampin with other drugs. Because all it takes is one point mutation in the RNA polymerase and poof, it's resistant. The third and possibly the most major issue with rifampin is something else, and that is drug-drug interactions. Specifically, rifampin ramps up cytochrome P450. Now you might be wondering, well, which enzyme does it ramp up specifically? Is it A? Is it B? Is it C? Is it D? Is it 2B6? Is it 2C8? Well, actually, we're not going to specify because rifampin ramps up a lot of the cytochrome P450 enzymes, much more than one. And that's precisely why it's going to interfere with so many other drugs. So should you memorize which drugs it interferes with? Well, maybe some of them. We'll talk about the more important ones in a second. But the real take home here is if you ever have a patient who's on rifampin or who you're putting on rifampin or whom you're considering putting on rifampin, you need to look carefully at their medication list. And this is really the take home of this video is that rifampin has serious drug-drug interactions. So what are some of the drugs that it interferes with? Well, one is warfarin. It can also mess with anticonvulsants, HIV treatments, especially protease inhibitors, methadone, so some patients might actually be correct in complaining that rifampin is chewing up their methadone, oral contraceptives, which could cause some problems, glucocorticoids, digitoxin, which is a version of digoxin that's actually eliminated uh, by the liver instead of the kidney, also some antiarrhythmics like verapamil, and finally cyclosporin. So what if you can't accept to have any of these drug-drug interactions? So for example, if you have a patient on a protease inhibitor and treating their HIV is your top priority, well, there actually is an alternative. If the patient has TB and you need to treat it, you can try rifabutin instead of rifampin. It has pretty similar antimicrobial effects, but much less induction of cytochrome P450 enzymes. So now you know the basics of rifampin, and if you want to tie all this up into a nice mnemonic taken from first aid, you can always remember the four R's. Rifampin acts by inhibiting RNA polymerase. Rifampin ramps up cytochrome P450, which is what gives it the drug-drug interactions. Rifampin causes you to have red-orange urine. And bacteria rapidly become resistant when you use rifampin alone.